morning we're picking up in chapter 3 of Colossians, where we left off last week in our series uh, through Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Uh, with a, uh, our series is called Christ, Creator, and King. And uh, we're going to focus on verses 15 through 17 today for a message that I've called A Christ-Centered Life. So follow along as we read our text this morning. God's word says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Father and our God, Lord, we do bow before you again this morning. And God, we're thankful for this word of truth. God, we know that all truth is your truth. And Lord, as we look to you this morning to reveal what we need to hear through your word, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be alive in our hearts and minds and God make your truth clear to us. And Lord, help us to understand the great need to put Christ at the center of our life and give the Lord Jesus preeminence in everything that we do. God, your will be done. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I came across a poem this week, and I'm not a big poem person. You don't hear me share a lot of them, but uh, uh, I think this uh, sort of demonstrates the Christ-centered life, and I think, uh, you know, that God has called us to this kind of life. The author's unknown, but I want you to notice the focus as I read it. Christ for sickness, Christ for health, Christ for poverty, Christ for wealth. Christ for joy, Christ for sorrow, Christ today, and Christ tomorrow. Christ my life and Christ my light. Christ for morning, noon, and night. Christ when all around gives way. Christ my everlasting stay. Christ my rest and Christ my food. Christ above my highest good, Christ my well-beloved friend, Christ my pleasure without end, Christ my Savior, Christ my Lord, Christ my portion, Christ my God, Christ my shepherd, I his sheep, Christ himself, my soul to keep. Christ my leader, Christ my peace. Christ has wrought my soul's release. Christ my righteousness divine. Christ for me, for he is mine. Christ my wisdom. Christ my meat. Christ restores my wandering feet. Christ my advocate and priest. Christ who ne'er forgets the least. Christ my teacher. Christ my guide. Christ my rock. In Christ I hide. Christ the ever living bread. Christ his precious blood hath shed. Christ hath brought me nigh to God. Christ the everlasting word. Christ my master. Christ my head, Christ who for my sins hath bled. Christ my glory, Christ my crown, Christ the plant of great renown. Christ my comforter on high, Christ my hope draws ever nigh. Wow. Are you that focused? on keeping Christ and his purposes at the center of all you do. I don't know that we could have added anything to that. 
And in the past couple of weeks, we've looked at a text describing the difference between actions and lives of sinners as opposed to the actions of a child of God. And those who uh, are, have Christ at the center of their life. And, and our text today, it continues with this idea of living like Jesus as a child of God. And throughout the, the rest of the letter, as we continue in this series, we're going to see actions and instructions for a life committed to Christ. This is the practical part of Paul's letter, and, and I guess the challenging part, where he calls these Christians at this church to live like Jesus, and to live the, the self, I mean, excuse me, the Christ-centered life. And maybe you've disappointed yourself in your life. We all have at some point. And maybe, um, you know, you, you just feel like you failed at living like Jesus. Maybe you've disappointed others and you feel like a failure because of that. But, you know, if, there's a, if you're a child of God and you belong to him, there's good news. He, he will forgive you. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But he don't just forgive us of our sins. When we come to him in faith, he indwells us with his Holy Spirit and all the power of the Holy Spirit of God in us. And that power gives us the ability to live like a child of God and to live a Christ-centered life. We don't really have an excuse if you belong to Jesus because he gives us everything we need to live like Jesus. And, you know, you'll find yourself closer to Christ in your life and, and, and more satisfied with your obedience if you keep Jesus Christ at the center and give him preeminence in your life. And I want to challenge you today from our text to live a Christ-centered life. You know, um, I'm sure many of you have a strong desire to do that, to live and love like Jesus, as our motto says in our church. But you might wonder, well, how in the world can I do this? And every week I try to help you by giving you something from Scripture to help you do that, and today's no different. I, I want to encourage you, as a child of God, to live a Christ-centered life by focusing on three important items concerning Christ or about Christ. And so uh, they come from our text today. And the first one is this. If you want to live a Christ-centered life, you've got to let the peace of Christ rule your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule. Not just your hearts, but your minds and, and everything about, about you. Um, in verse 15 it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So that's the main meat of what I want to share with you this morning. Some translations read, Let the peace of Christ rule. Or some translate it to Messiah. Uh, Messiah is the Hebrew word, that means anointed one. And Christ is the Greek word that means anointed one. So they're the same word, just in different languages. And, uh, you know, so there's apparently some manuscript variances because uh, my translation, and maybe yours, says let the peace of God. But listen, does it really make any difference since Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? So the answer to that question is no. The peace of God and the peace of Christ are the same peace, aren't they? And so it really doesn't make any difference how we look at this text, but, but the word for peace here means to be assured or confident and secure in the love and care of Christ. <laughs> yeah, I, I want you to understand peace this morning. We've got far too many people in our churches and in, in our homes today full of anxiety and fear and worry who belong to Jesus who's going to give us the victory, like we've just said. And so we don't have any reason for that. In Christ, we can have peace. And, and, and God, it means, and, and when you have this peace of Christ, it means you're confident that God will care for you regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. That's the peace of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. 
It's faith. Anxiety and worry and fear are not based in faith. And those things say, I don't trust you, Jesus. That's not where we want to live when we belong to him, is it? We can trust him, and so we should trust him. So, but apart from Christ, you will never truly know or experience his peace. If you're not one of his, you won't experience it. And, uh, you, and, you know, if you really want the peace of God, you must surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. That's the only way you get this peace of God that's in our text this morning. And to let it rule, you've got to be a child of God who surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord. And so he says, let this peace of Christ rule. And this, this word rule here, I, you know, we, we understand what the word rule means, but it's the same word if we go back to chapter 2 and verse 16 in Colossians where we, it says, it's translated, so let no one judge you in food or drink or festivals or new moons or Sabbaths. And some of you may remember that if you're here when we talk about that. The word for judge here is a word that was often used in Olympic games to refer to a referee. And when a referee makes a ruling, they're making a judgment call about something in that event. Umpires call balls and strikes. And you may disagree with them, but guess whose judgment stands? <laughs> it's the umps, isn't it? It don't matter if you argue with them. I found that out the hard way. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the idea is to let here is to let the peace of Christ be the ultimate referee or decision maker in your relationships with other believers. Here he's, he's really tying us together as a body of Christ. And he's saying, uh, you know, let, uh, he, he's saying to let the peace of God rule or judge your hearts. Because you've been called into this one body of Christ. And so uh, a heart that doesn't let the peace of Christ rule is a heart that's not right with God. You hear that? Is that the truth? Say amen if it's the truth. A heart that does not let the peace of Christ rule is a heart that's not right with God. So that means it's time to let that anxiety and fear and worry that's out of control, let it go. And let the peace of God rule your heart. You see, a heart that is demonstrating a continual prevalence of the peace of Christ is proof that a heart is right with God. You see people go through things and you think, how in the world are they not falling apart? <laughs> I'll tell you what's keeping them together. It's the peace of Christ. It's the peace of God. They have a right relationship with God. And if your heart is never at peace and you're constantly overwhelmed with anxiety and fear or hate and vengefulness, that's the opposite of faith. And Christ, and Christ is not at the center of your thinking. So you're not trusting Him. That's not how God has called those who are His to live. <laughs> He's called us to live in peace. Remember last week we said sometimes you got to put up with other people. And sometimes that's how you got to, that's what you got to do to keep peace. And you ought to be okay with that sometimes, right? And now notice the phrase, which also you were called in one body. And so the peace of Christ is a uniting point for all the members of the body of Christ. And we are to act as one. We are one body in Christ. We are working together as a body. And to do that, we've got to let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. And then he finishes with the command to be thankful. And you could translate it to be continually thankful. To always be thankful. And being grateful you know, to God, it can lead to an attitude of peace. When you're thankful, that can give you peace. But you know why we don't have peace a lot of times? Because we're ungrateful. And I was just thinking about folks who, who are constantly worrying about their lives and and thinking they got the raw end of the stick. And you ought to read the Fox's Book of Martyrs or read the testimonies of some of these people who, uh, who, who 
live lives uh, in severe persecution because of their faith in Christ. And you ought to be thankful. You ought to be thankful for the life God gives you. Even if it seems tough. Because he's using you and he, 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 he wants to show his glory through your life. And one of the ways we do that is by having our faith strongly in him revealed by a heart of peace. The peace of God. And peace can lead to thanksgiving and, and that type of activity leads to peace in the body of Christ. So we should do everything we can to be at peace and to keep the peace with God and with one another. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, in Paul's letter to the churches at Ephesus, he writes something similar. He says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, because there's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling. And so we should do everything we can to be at peace and keep the peace with everyone else in the body of Christ. And that peace comes from a relationship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where that peace comes from. In 1555, Nicholas Ridley was burned at the stake because of his witness for Christ. And the night before his execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison uh, chamber to, be, to assist him and to comfort him on his last night. But Nicholas declined that offer, and he said, you know, he says, he basically said this, he says, I'm going to go to bed and sleep as quietly and peacefully as I ever have. <laughs> because he knew the peace of God, he could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of the Lord Jesus to meet his need. You don't make a decision like that apart from the peace of Christ in your heart. That's the peace of Christ. It's comfort in times of stress. It's patience in times of worry. It's fearlessness in times of fear. And it's available only to those whose faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, <laughs> which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the peace of God, folks, and that's how you get it. The, let the peace of God rule your hearts and minds. Another item to focus on the Christ-centered life is this. Not only let the peace of God rule, but let the word of Christ remain. Now look at verse 16 with me. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You know, frequently in scripture we come across this phrase, the word of God. We see it in the prophets and, and uh, you know, there's lots of places where you can read that, the word of God. But in verse 16 here, it's the only place in the Bible where we read the word of Christ. And I want to remind you, though, again, Christ is God. So uh, they are interchangeable. So it really makes no difference in overall meaning. The word of God is the word of Christ. And the word of Christ is the word of God. And so the text says to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now that word dwell is, uh, means to make an abode or a home, to reside in a place is what it means. In um, John chapter 1 where it says the word became flesh and dwelled among us. That's the same word. He made, he pitched his tent or he remained, he stayed with us. And so he made his home uh, with us. And so, uh, and so sometimes it's translated remain. And, and, and you know, you're, you remain at the place where you dwell, don't you? Uh, that, that's kind of one way to look at it. And, and, and we want the word of Christ to remain on us and in us. You see, here's the truth. A child of God doesn't need a little bit of the word of God every now and then. That's not what we need. We need all of the word of God to remain on us all the time. Y'all understand the difference? 
And a lot of folks, they just want a little bit of the Word of God here and there. Just when we need it. But as a child of God, we need all the Word of God all the time in every situation and in every circumstance. That's what it means to let the Word of Christ dwell. It means to let the Word of Christ remain on you, to stay upon you. And so the phrase then, he says, richly in all wisdom, gives us the idea of abundance. Richly. That's abundance. That's more than we need, isn't it? And so God's word's more than enough to give us wisdom to discern God's path in any given situation. And so Ray Fowler, I love the way he puts this. He says, let God's word find a home in your heart. Don't make it a temporary visitor. Don't treat it like a house guest, but let God's word live there. Let it take up permanent residence day in and day out. Let the word of Christ remain. Let the word of God take up residence in your life. Let it rule your life. The text gives us a reason then to let the word of Christ remain. He says, teaching and admonishing one another, first of all. And so we're to teach one another the word of Christ. We're, we, and you know, we really do constantly learn from one another as we live and as we obey the word of God and as we study the Bible together and we teach by example of obedience and sometimes uh, by disobedience that we, we learn. <laughs> and, and, and so here teaching, you see, describes positive instruction. Telling us what we should do and how to do it and, and things like that. The word admonishing is kind of the inverse of that. That's teaching by warning and correction. And, and so you, you, you see someone walking a dangerous path. You, you see someone living in error. You give them the word of Christ in love and truth and help them correct the error of their ways. That's admonishing. But here we understand both teaching and admonishment are necessary in learning the word of God and living the word of God and letting the word of God remain upon us and in us as we live by the word of God you see but but you can't obey the word of God and live the word of God unless first you know the word of God right you've got to know the word of God and so you know it helps if you have learning partners and we do have partners in the body of Christ in his church and one of the ways we learn the truth of God's Word and put some things to memory is often through singing. And that's what's mentioned here as, as a way for us to teach and admonish one another. And so, first of all, he mentions psalms. And uh, psalms are basically, we know what the psalms are, don't we? The Old Testament. And these were songs that were sung by the Hebrews in worship. And, uh, and so... Maybe we should sing more of those. And there are a lot of them that have been put to music for us to sing. And, and they're all awesome. Or most of them are awesome. I'll put it that way. Okay. Hymns is another word that means praise or uh, religious odes, like poems and things that you can sing along with. And, and so um, it's a more, um, I guess, uh, it can include psalms, but it's more than just psalms, you see. And in spiritual songs is basically, literally, when you translate, the, the words are, is, is spiritual odes is what it is. And, and so it's spiritual songs. And this can refer to, you know, it's songs that refer to any spiritual matters really at all. And, uh, but don't, I don't know about you, but I love the songs that I can see that come directly from the Word of God and reflect the truth of the Word of God. There's no better songs than those. And so this is what I think he's getting at. And, and uh, so this describes three types of songs, and there's some overlap. And, and some of the songs, they may be all three. But the important thing to note is, is that our songs should match Scripture. And in, in worship, we shouldn't sing anything that tr contradicts the truth of the Word of God. And every now and then, Jeremy and I have a discussion, and we say, you know what, we're not going to sing that one anymore because we don't think it's scriptural. And so some of them have been canned. 
that maybe you hear other places. And, and if you want us to sing one and we say we don't sing that, we'll explain why. <laughs> but, but, you know, maybe we're wrong. But we want to make sure we're singing songs that honor God and that are true to the Word of God. And we should sing the Word of God. It's a great way, really, to teach and learn and memorize truths of Scripture. Uh, lots of times people memorize stuff by putting it to a tune. And so uh, that can help us. And these things can be applied to your life in order to help you live a Christ-centered life. But notice what the end of verse 16 says. He says, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so we know he's talking about singing here because of that. And when we sing, listen, when we sing in worship and when our praise team's up here, our praise team's not up here to perform for you. And when we're singing, we're not singing to perform for each other. When we come together for worship and we're singing, you ought to have one focus, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne. We have an audience of one, and we seek to please him with an offering of praise. That's what it's about. And I think that's what he's getting at here, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, to the Lord. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he gives a similar message in chapter 5, and he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'll let the word of Christ remain. And teach one another the word of Christ and remind one another of the word of Christ. You know, it, 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 it seems that uh, famous scientist Albert Einstein had more trouble finding his way home from work than he did finding the key to atomic power. <laughs> one evening, it said, as Einstein sat deep in thought aboard the train that brought him home every night, the porter approached him and, and, uh, to collect his ticket. And Einstein rummaged around his coat, through his pockets and his shirt and everywhere else he could think of. And, and uh, growing alarmed at his, at his inability to find his ticket, the porter said, that's okay, Dr. Einstein. He said, I know you ride this train every day. I can collect it tomorrow. And <laughs> Einstein said, that's fine for you, young man, but how am I supposed to know where to get off the train without my ticket? <laughs> And I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a fun little story. And, and you know, we, we have heard a lot of times of his absent-mindedness. But I want to tell you something this morning. The word of Christ tells you where to get on, and it tells you where to get off. And you better pay attention to what it says and where it leads you. And, and, and so let the word of God, let the word of Christ remain on you. Study scripture. Read the Bible. I challenge you, if you've not read the Bible through, just read it through. I know some parts are difficult and it's easy to get discouraged. Just keep reading and ask God to reveal truth to you. Read the Bible. Memorize Scripture. Study Scripture. If you're not in a Bible study, get in a Bible study. Start one on your own. I'll show you how. We, we, we do it on Wednesday nights in our adult class. Show you one way to just kind of study the Bible without a whole lot of effort and come to truths and applications for your life. And, and, and walk with the Lord. That's why we need the, the word of God at the center of our life. And to stay on us is so that we can walk with the Lord. That's the Christ-centered life. A life that lets the word of God direct our lives. Tell us where to go. When to get on. Where to get off. How long to stay. And what to do while we're there. Okay? Focus on letting the peace of Christ rule your hearts and minds. And focus on letting the word of Christ Remain upon you always. Another item to focus on for the Christ-centered life is this. Let the name of Christ reign. Look at verse 17 with me. You've probably heard this verse quoted many times. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you really want to live a Christ-centered life, you've got to let the peace of Christ rule 
And you've got to let the word of Christ remain. And you've got to let the name of Christ reign. Let the name of Christ reign supreme in everything you do. He says, whatever you do in word, that's what you say, isn't it? Whatever you do in word, that, that's what you say. Or maybe you write. It could be. And whatever you say must be said in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you should seek to honor the name of the Lord Jesus in everything you say. All the time. And in the same, in whatever you do. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. A similar take is found in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 10.31 he says, Therefore whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Very similar. And he's talking about doing things in the name of Christ. Letting the name of Christ be uh, revealed in what you say and what you do. And you might, you might know, and I'm sure you know, that names in Scripture carried a, a lot of significance to these people. Their names mean something. A lot of our names, we don't have any idea what they mean. That's a, you know, mom and daddy, they just like that sounding, you know. It can mean anything. <laughs> but names in the Bible have significance because of their meaning. And there were times when God even changed people's names to reflect a new purpose. He changed the name Abram to Abraham. He changed Jacob's name to Israel. And so, and there's many others, but when you gave your life to Christ, did you know your name changed too? Your name changed too. You know, when I became a Christian, when I gave my life to Christ, I was no longer just Derek McCosh. I became Derek McCosh Christian. Now I belong to him. God is my father. And everything I say or do reflects on him. And we've already talked about this some, but I bear the name of Christ because I belong to him. And if you are his, you bear the name of Christ too. And everything you do reflects who you are in him. So everything you do should bring glory and honor to him. That should be our heart's desire, shouldn't it? It's the name of Jesus that we possess authority that enables us to do what he wants us to do. It's in his name. In terms of, of authority, we're under the lordship of Christ. We're given authority to act on his behalf, and we're sent out by him. And, but not only do we bear his authority, but we also bear his uh, uh, accountability or responsibility. So nothing should be permitted in our lives that cannot be associated with Jesus. <coughs> everything you do and say should be focused on Christ and his purpose that ought to be our goal is that the way you're living your life is Christ at the center of everything you do and say that's the question you know? um, that's what we must do if we live a Christ centered life I read this story about a visit from a young pastor. He said, years ago when I was a youth assistant pastor, <coughs> he said, I visited an older lady from the congregation in the hospital. He said, I was in a grumbly mood that day about everything in my life, and I wished things were different, you know. And he said, if only this, or if only that, or if only this and that, you know, that's kind of how he was thinking. And he said, then I'd be happy. And he said, I visited this lady in quarantine because they thought she had the swine flu. She had also broken a hip, which that's why she was rushed to the hospital in the first place. And he said, on top of that, she had recently buried her husband of 60 years. And he said, since she was in quarantine, he said, I had to put on something like a hazmat suit to visit her. And he said she didn't have her hearing aids in or her glasses on, and she could only see my eyes. <laughs> and so it took her a while for him to explain to her who he was. But when she finally made the connection, she grabbed, she, he says, she grabbed my hand and said, Oh, pastor, 
God is so good to me. But he said, so you got a healthy man in his mid-twenties grumbling about his life. And you got a grieving, grieving 90-year-old lady with a broken hip in quarantine giving thanks to God. (laughs) And he says, now which heart do you think was set on Christ in the hour before that lady and I sat together in that hospital room? He said, it wasn't mine. You see, being full of Christ leads to thankfulness. A Christ-centered life leads to thankfulness and joy and peace and steadfastness and gratefulness. Does that describe your life? That's what we want to think about this morning. That's what this passage is all about. It's about doing it for Jesus because of everything he does for us. It's all about a Christ-centered life. I want to urge you to let Christ have preeminence in your life. Today's the day to put King Jesus in his rightful place. Now maybe you've put you've been on your throne too long. It's time to put Jesus there. Let him rule and reign where he belongs, in your heart and in your mind, in your purpose, and everything you say and do. Will you come to him and give your heart and life to him in faith if you're not his today? he's, He's calling some of you, I'm sure today, to come to him in faith. It's time to surrender in faith to Christ and become a child of God. Today's the day to do that. Now's the time. And maybe you say, Pastor Derek, I know I'm a Christian, but... But but far too often, I don't really live the Christ-centered life. My life is really more about me than him. I'm more focused on on that than anything. And I, I want to ask you, will you just repent of that focus and put Christ at the center of all you do? Take a step back and let Jesus rule and reign where he belongs. It's time to take a step of diligence and let the word of Christ remain upon you always. It's time to take a step of humility and let the name of Christ reign in all you say and do. Now's the time to do that. We do that this morning. Now's the time. Let's pray and let's respond in faith to the Lord Jesus this morning. And let's give him our hearts, our minds, and our lives. And let him be at the center of everything we are and do. Lord Jesus, we do bow before you this morning. God, we give you this invitation. and God, we pray today that you'd help all of us live a Christ-centered life. Put you at the rightful place, God, and to let your peace reign and rule in our hearts and lives. God, let your word remain and lead and direct our hearts and lives. God, we pray that we would let your name reign supreme in everything that we do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.